Good evening, everyone. This is Dr. Chong here. Um, Ask Families for Life is a special Q&A online series uh, that provides families with a platform to have their concerns and questions delivered by one of FFL's knowledge specialists. I am Dr. Chong Yahweh from the Singapore Medical Specialist Centre. And today we will be discussing how you can guard your family from COVID-19. Share your comments and your questions uh, for me in the comment bo box below and I'll try my best to answer you. Uh, I'll first start with a little update on the local situation in Singapore. As you know, we have another 1,000 cases today. So that brings it to about 1,000, more than 10,000 cases uh, in total. We still have about 11 deaths, so that's quite fortunate. The death rate is quite low. Um, our community cases are also about 1,000. But the dormitory cases are quite a lot. There are about 9,000 of them. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, these uh, dormitory cases. Um, we're still testing a lot of people. And to date, we have tested more than 90 over 1,000 uh, tests run in Singapore. And maybe about tested about 60 over 1,000 people. Um, in Singapore, um, right now, this... Uh, dorm situation is something we are keeping our eyes on. Uh, but a very important figure you've got to pay attention to is actually the um, number of local cases. So I'm glad to say that the, see today that the number of local cases is about 15. I think in the last two days it was 30, 20 something. So now it's come down to 15. And this is actually what the circuit breaker is all about. The circuit breaker is trying to crush the curve of these uh, community spread. So we hope that uh, the number of local cases will continue to come down. Um, as for the dorm, well, there are about 300,000 um, foreign workers living in the dorms. About 200,000 of them are inside 43 dormitories. Um, and the rest of the 100,000 are in much, much smaller dormitories. Um, uh, as you know by now that uh, our government is paying a lot of attention to th to these uh, dormitories, and we've set up medical centers inside every dormitory. We have also moved people who are healthy out of it or who are running essential services, and we're testing many, many, many of these workers. Now, testing them uh, aggressively is contributing to the, the large numbers you're seeing. So. Uh, try to not panic when you see these big numbers. Um, now, where we are now is uh, quite a um, tricky situation. So why is that? Uh, why is this virus so effective, so infective? Well, I try to explain to you why. And I really call it a perfect virus because it's like following the 80-20 rule. 80% of the patients are very mild and have a mild disease. They literally can just sleep in a bed for a week and they get better. And you just have to give them Panadol. In fact, this is what a lot of these uh, very well patients uh, are doing. They're just lying in the isolation room. We're giving them Panadol and they get well. Now, fortunately, although we have so many uh, dormitory uh, worker patients, most of them are very young, below the age of 30. And they are very fit because they are obviously blue collar workers. And as a result, they are not very sick and they have very mild disease. So fortunately, if you look at our ICU figures, they have not gone up very much, even though we have a lot of uh, COVID patients. And that's because a lot of these workers are young and fit. Now, so 80% of these uh, patients 80% of COVID patients are young and fit. And uh, the other um, 20% can be divided into 16 plus 4%. Now, the 4%, you know, they enter ICU and they are on ventilator. Now, in Singapore, our ICU number of patients is very, very small. It's only 20-something compared to nearly 9, 000, uh, sorry 10,000 patients. So that's a very, very small number. But in other countries, you're looking at about 4% of them are in ICU and on ventilators. Now, the other 16%, what happens to them? Well, they need oxygen. Yeah.
so um, coming back to coming back to my situation that I'm explaining to you is that um, this twenty percent this twenty percent that is sixteen and four percent the sixteen percent uh, use oxygen. Now they just use a nasal prong oxygen, and you know this little tube in the nose, and then it delivers about for two to four liters of oxygen a minute. Then you, the next step up is you have a venti mask or venturi mask. This delivers maybe about ten to 12, fifteen liters per minute, and then after that you have uh, the BiPAP CPAP machines, which are something close to ventilator machines. So in countries like in countries like uh, Spain, Italy, New York, Wuhan. Um, there are so many patients of these 20% patients that come in and they saturate all the oxygen resources. And then the patient just comes in and gas and die. So this is really a perfect virus in that sense. And uh, at the moment, I'd like to go on to the next part of my talk and that is to explain to you uh, why everybody is so stressed up about this whole uh, COVID situation. Now, a lot of us are experiencing a lot of stress, a lot of grief. And what is this grief? Actually, it's a loss. We, we have lost our normal life. You know, we have, lost, we have lost connection to our families, our friends, our parents, our loved ones. And uh, there's also fear that we may have economic loss, you know, loss of salary, loss of a job, and so on. Um, a salary cut, etc. So a lot of this grief is what I call anticipatory grief. That means this grief is kind of in the future. It's kind of like the grief that you experience when you find that a loved one has, for example, cancer. And then your loved one's in front of you, but you're thinking in the future, what's going to happen to this person and so on and so on. You're thinking the worst. So the grief is kind of like anticipatory and looking into the future. So quite important is that when you feel all this grief, you try to bring yourself into the present and not think too much about the future because that's where the grief is hiding. Now, when we're faced with grief and loss, the first thing we do is all the stages of grief. So the first thing we do is we, de we are in denial or we believe the virus will go away. It will disappear. It won't come and harm us. And then next stage, we go into anger. <laughs> So we start blaming somebody. Oh, that person came very close to me and nearly infected me. And, and some leaders blame another country for, for the virus. Um, then we go into bargaining. Bargaining is, for example, uh, if I tell myself, oh, if I social distance, if I, if I don't do this, if I don't do that, everything will be better and the virus will go away. And the next stage after that will be sadness. Sadness is when you feel, oh, you feel very hopeless. Oh, how long is this going to go on? And uh, when will this all end? A fifth stage of grief will be acceptance. So we're moving from the first four stages into the fifth stage. And that is acceptance. Acceptance is when you have to figure out that, look, how am I going to proceed? How am I going to how am I going to get on with this? And this is where you say to yourself, okay, I can wash hands, I can wear a mask, I can social distance, I can work from home, etc., etc. So you take control of the situation and that helps you a lot in to accept the situation for what it is. Um, sometimes there's also another stage after that and that is meaning. Meaning means you have to find meaning in what's happening to all of us here. Uh, you know, for example, hey, the air is cleaner, the pollution is gone, the wildlife is coming back, um, the, the planet is greener, and uh, things are better, and now we are all working from home. Uh, you know, it's not a bad thing. We don't have to spend money on clothes to go to office or to work. We don't have to spend money on transport or meals. Uh, maybe we can even take a, 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 a smaller salary because of this. So, so a lot of things are going to change after this. And this is where we're going to find meaning for ourselves, our families, uh, our, our uh, clan, our uh, nation, and even our world. So these are the stages of grief we are going through. Now, somewhere in the middle of all this grief, of course, you will have waves of panic. You will have panic, 
you will feel very, very anxious. So you have to shift your balance. You have to try to think the best and not the worst. And you know social media doesn't help because there's so much on social media, so much fake news, so much misinformation. And a lot of people are talking about a lot of things and pushing their own agenda. So some of this agenda is not really altruistic and not really for the best of mankind. So try to come into the present and not stay in the future. Remember I told you that grief is actually all in the future. So you try to come into the present and look at what's around you. Be thankful for the family around you, you know, your home and, and, and your loved ones and so on. And, uh, when, and the fact that you serve a job and you still have uh, a family to, to talk to and to be with. Also, you have to let go what you cannot control. There are certain things we just cannot control, so we just have to let that go. And more important, you've got to be compassionate and kind. So, for example, you've gone to buy food, you thank the person, you know, at the store where you're picking up the food, you thank the person, thank you very much, you know, um, etc. Or have a kind act um, and so on. So, I, I think it's this will all help us uh, with the grief reaction. Now, after we talk about grief reaction, then there are certain things which are more practical, which I think uh, we would like to um, tell you about. So these will be, for example, I, I'll, there are a few aspects. So one is a social aspect, for example. You know, so socially, you're still working for a home, for example. You try to build a routine, you know, wake up, shower, uh, eat your breakfast, dress comfortably, you don't have to dress to go to work, and then uh, maybe log into your work computer at a fixed time, arrange a morning meeting with all your colleagues online, um, and socially you should try to connect with your family members even though you can't see them and you're not supposed to go see your elderly parents, but try to see whether you can FaceTime or Skype them, or, or even have your children Skype their grandparents, or your children uh, Skype their friends, you know. So, so this is a social aspect because a lot of thing about going to work is actually the social part, and that is something that we all miss terribly. Uh, the next thing is physical, of course. You got to make sure you have good exercise. Um, there, there's a lot of thing about going out to do your exercise. Some people uh, say, "Oh, you don't wear a mask and all that," but I think right now, uh, when you do exercise, you just try to make sure you are not in a crowded place and you're alone and uh, you know uh, then you don't have to wear a mask uh, but getting out and exercising is very important because you've got to be out there with nature if you can't be out with nature open your window and look at a view or whatever you know uh, stand on your, your balcony and then look out to the world uh, connect with nature other things you should do is, for example, you can do stretching, you can do yoga, you can do Pilates, you can do some dancing at home. There are lots of videos on the net. You, you can even do your uh, high-intensity fitness training uh, because a lot of the gyms are actually closed, so you can do that. And if you're out there on a park connector or in a garden, then you do your jogging, running, or your walking, or your brisk walking, and so on. We also found that what is very calming is repetitive movements. So, for example, uh, like if you're skipping a rope. Yeah? And you know how we rock children to sleep? That's a repetitive movement. Ah, so repetitive movements actually are very calming on the person and reduce the anxiety. So that's something you've got to think about. The other movement that's very good is left-right movement. So, for example, if you're doing some sort of... a uh, jumping jack or you're doing jumping from side to side, you know, a left-right movement or when you're running, you're actually moving your hands left and right. So these movements are also very, very calming and reduce anxiety. So these are some of the practical things. Now, another aspect that we like you to, to we have to be practical about is, of course, the mental aspect. So as I've mentioned before, build a routine, make sure you break up your days into blocks all right, interrupted by your knee meals, and uh, sleep and wake up at the same time. Don't oversleep, you know, although you're not 
at work, but don't oversleep. Sleep and wake up at the same time. Make sure you have good sleep hygiene. Sleep at the same time. Wake up at the same time. And uh, uh, read your books or read some serious classic novel which you never had time to read. Or go and read one of your texts related to your book. Improve yourself uh, to your, sorry, one of the texts related to your work. Uh, like, for example, for me, I will go read my internal medicine textbook. Um, then, if you are looking at news and, and things on the web, please limit yourselves to experts, experts and reputable websites. So, for example, in America, I always tell my patients, go, go look up this guy called Dr. Fauci. He is an advisor to uh, President Trump, and he's very, very, very good. And there are a lot of very reputable websites on the net that you can look at. And there's a lot of stuff coming in through your WhatsApp and your Telegram feed. So please be careful about looking at those because half of those or a lot of those are actually quite disturbing and not, not really quite uh, accurate. And, f and for goodness sake, do not, uh, do not give yourself into speculation or conspiracy because that's everywhere in the net. All right. Uh, some things about oh somebody invented this virus and unleashed it on the world. Uh, all this is just conspiracy theories. So please, for your mental state of mind, do not you know get yourself involved with all these all these kind of news. Other things you can do, for example, your around the house will be cook and bake. That's quite therapeutic. Clean the house. A lot of people like to clean the house when they're under stress and when they're anxious. And a household project, for example, you'll be meaning to to do something for your about your cupboard, that, that cupboard with lots of junk in there, clear out the junk, do something about it, or do some creative thing like art, music, language, and so on. So these are some of the practical things you can do. So I've talked about the social aspect, the physical part of it, uh, the mental part of it, and then now I'd like to talk about the religious part of it. If you have a religion, please, you know, pray pray to your your God, your Creator, and uh, meditation is very important as well. I found this very good uh, app on the on the web. It's called Headspace. It is uh, pretty uh, good. So it's something you you can look at. It's called Headspace. About 16 million people in the world are using it. So it's it's quite a a good app to use. It helps. It teaches you a little bit of meditation, lesson by lesson, and it's quite quite useful. Now, in a household, everybody's under a lot of stress. Everybody's together the whole day. So there's a lot of emotions. There's a lot of stress, as I told you, the grief reaction, the loss reaction. So try to maintain peace at home. Try to control emotions. Please control, keep everything in check, right? Do not yell or, or shout or scream unnecessarily. Um, and I like to have a little talk about, uh, also to share a little bit about young children. Now, if a lot of us will have uh, uh, young children in our household. So that is something that, uh, again, um, it's something you have to think about. Um, in front of young children, of course, obviously limit social media, um, look for the good stories to share with them. Uh, they will see your reaction to bad stories or conspiracies or, or, or speculation, and then they'll see the fear on your face. So please, um, you know, be careful about looking at all this news in front of them. And uh, like I said, connect with your grandparents on Skype or connect with their uh, friends on Skype or, or whatever media that, uh, that you can find. Um, a lot of a lot of families <laughs> lined up at Toys R Us to buy board games, and that's quite a good idea. Jigsaw puzzles, all these are good ideas to do something together with the children. Actually, children love the 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 fact that you are at home with them the whole day. <laughs> they find it very unusual, but actually they love that. Um, and uh, the other thing is um, they are also mindful of the fact that their routine is somewhat different. But obviously, you are there whole day with them. It's very, very nice. So some things you can do, for example, uh, you can exercise with, with them, uh, build an obstacle course at home or do some kind of exercise routine together or, you know, um, uh, do a project together. Like, for example, if you have a pet, you can bathe the pet together 
and and so on. Um, meals are very important with the children, so bonding over food, a cozy place where they can retreat, so have a little corner where they can retreat with lots of, uh, let's say, fluffy toys, things that have texture. There's always things about senses, so you know something you can touch, something you can feel. So uh, that's why we call, have this thing called a security blanket. Uh, they they like to hold on to something that they're very comfortable with. For example, a big stuffed toy, etc. So there's a there's a, it's good to have a little place where you have a lot of these um, uh, sensory kind of uh, kits for children. So now I've kind of um, uh, said what I needed to say, and uh, I see there are some questions coming in right now. So I'll just stop here for a minute and answer some of these questions. And the first question is, um, hi, doctor. So we've been hearing that elderly are more susceptible to COVID-19. What about children? I have a premature baby, uh, Premi. She's 14 months corrected but has chronic lung disease. We can't find baby mass. How can we protect her, especially when we sometimes have to bring her in for checkup? Now, I think that um, from what we know about this virus is that it affects the elderly quite a bit. So that's why our, our leadership here is telling the elderly to stay home. Uh, and also when the elderly come, come in and they have complications because they have a, lot, a lot of them have chronic diseases, they will probably end up in the ICU and they may end up in the ICU for weeks. Uh, so, so this is really a, a huge burden on the healthcare sector. So that's why we've been asking all our elderly to stay at home and in particular all their children not to visit them for this time because we really don't want them to catch anything so that's for the elderly what about children we have found from uh, the data that children actually seem to have a very much milder disease and uh, we know from some data now that because there are some targets in the lung uh, for adults you know you may have heard of something called the ACE2 receptor so there's a target in which the virus attacks in the lung. And in children, these targets are much, much less. So that's why it looks like in children, it's a milder disease. Uh, in fact, there was a, there was a uh, I think one of our first ba uh, babies in Singapore that was a COVID patient, was in KK for about a week or two weeks. And I think from what I, I read from some of the reports, um, the data is that um, baby had uh, virtually no fever for the whole period of stay except for once one occasion when they just gave some syrup and the fever went away so it looks like in children it's quite a mild disease finding a mask for a 14 for a, a 14 month baby is very very difficult you and I know that <laughs> that's why the guideline is we do not mask anybody under the age of two uh, so I I wouldn't even bother trying to find a mask for her, all right? And I think as long as uh, you keep uh, your hand hygiene and uh, yourself, you, you, you wear a mask and your husband wear a mask and you keep your hand hygiene, it's, it's, very, it's good enough. Now, hand hygiene, why is it so important? This COVID virus, it's droplet. Okay, no matter, no matter what people say, we still think it's droplet if it, because it infects one COVID patient probably infects two to three persons. Some say four, but it's in that range. If it was aerosol spread, then it will probably be in a range of one person infect 15. And a classic example is measles. Measles is, is that kind of uh, infectivity. So we still believe it's droplet. And so droplet means when you when the person coughs, the droplet flies about 10 feet, settles on surfaces. The phlegm surrounds the virus and protects it. So it settles on the surfaces in about 30 to 60 minutes, the phlegm dries up, the mucus dries up, and the virus dies. The problem is that we can't see the droplet, we touch it, and we touch our face. So the virus is on our face, and it enters through the mucous membranes, which is the eye, the nose, and the mouth. The other place, so do not touch your face until you've cleaned your hands. And uh, the other thing that you should be very careful about is touching your hair or flicking your hair. So what happens is that the droplet on the hair, the hair protects the droplet. So the droplet stays viable longer. And if you wear a cap or a hat, 
it'll stay even longer. So that's the reason why hand hygiene is so important. Um, and honestly, soap and water is good enough. Uh, the reason why we use alcohol swabs for doctors is because in between patients, it's very difficult for us to run to the sink and come back to the patient. So we use alcohol rubs in between patients. But for, for everyone at home, honestly, soap and water is really good enough. And our tap water kills the virus. And the soap destroys the mucus envelope. So I think I cannot emphasize this hand hygiene uh, uh, more, than more than enough. Now, the next question is, hi, Dr. Chong. While I'm thankful the number of community cases seem to be decreasing, should we still be concerned about possible asymptomatic carriers going around in the community? Okay, first of all, you use this word asymptomatic. Uh, this is different from pre-symptomatic. Okay, what's the difference? Asymptomatic means they'll never have symptoms ever. Pre-symptomatic is one day they'll have fever. So that's the difference. So I'll first talk about um, these uh, carriers, so, so to speak. Um, what we do in Singapore for maybe the last 20 years is we routinely swap patients in polyclinics and in certain GP clinics for flu, for influenza, because we want to know what is the latest strain of influenza in Singapore. So we've been swabbing these people routinely and we do it like for 20 years or, or longer already. And unfortunately, from these routine swabs, we have found COVID. So there is COVID out there in the community somewhere and floating around. And that's why we have the circuit breaker. Now, I'm thankful that the number of community cases seems to be coming down. Uh, yes, we are worried about the carriers out there, the asymptomatic or the pre-symptomatic carriers. But I think it's very important that we all participate uh, clearly in this circuit breaker. And that is we actually do our social distancing and our, ma our universal masking and our hand hygiene. And this is the only way we can break this chain of pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic carriers in the, in the community. All right. I hope I've answered your question. Um, one last thing about this uh, circuit breaker. It's been extended, as you know, to, to, to the 1st of June. Um, we want to see this number of community cases come down to single digits and possibly zero. Uh, we are all looking carefully, carefully at this number. Uh, the dorm workers are different because they are segregated. They are in, they are in the dorms and they are uh, kind of apart from the community. So don't let those numbers panic you. Keep your eye on the community cases. Now, coming back to another person has asked me about asymptomatic carrier. Honestly, asymptomatic carrier, we don't know enough about this because we can't test everybody in the population. Why can't we test everybody? If we can test everybody in the population, we can tell you who's the asymptomatic carrier. Pre-symptomatic carrier, we'll know because that person will develop symptoms uh, soon. Now, we know that on the average, it takes about four days to incubate uh, the virus. So from the day they, they're infected to the day they have symptoms, about four days. And, f and from, our, from our contact tracing, we know that A transmits to B to C to D. From the contact tracing, we know that the, diff the number of days between A and B, B and C, C and D is on the average four days. So this very short incubation period and this very short serial interval period means that there is pre-symptomatic spread. And a lot of the patients on the first day of the symptoms, they, are, they have very high viral load already. So they are, they got a lot of virus, they're shedding a lot of virus. So that's why this virus is so powerful. And the first few days, they have very high viral load, they shed a lot of virus. Then by the eighth day, this goes down to a very low level. So this is what we know at this point. Uh, Asymptomatic cases, we don't know enough because we cannot swap the whole population. And why can't we swap the whole population? Because the test we are doing right now is called RT-PCR. It's where we swap the, the nose of the patient and we find the RNA of the uh, virus. 
we mirror image the RNA and the DNA, and then we amplify the DNA and we detect the virus. So this is a very laborious process. It takes about six to eight hours at, at the least, at the fastest, to give you a result. And the, the reason why we can't uh, scale it up is because this is such a laborious process. There are a lot of things involved, reagents and so on. And, and th these are all limiting us from, from um, uh, pushing up to huge numbers where we can test the whole population. Now, you may have heard about antibody tests, but the antibody tests are not good enough at this point in time. And we also don't know when the antibody appears after the person catches a virus, because it takes a few days. On the average, it takes about five to 10 days for the antibody to appear. So if you do the antibody test too early, you won't detect anything. So this is the weakness of the antibody test. The antibody test will be much faster. It can, it be, can be a pinprick and it be like a pregnancy test. It can be done very fast. But it is still far away from uh, replacing the uh, DNA amplification test that we are doing right now. Now, is there a cause for panic? Uh, that's my next question. Since there's such a high number of unlinked cases, well, that is what the circuit breaker is for. We need to crush the curve and crush this um, tr um, transmission or number of unlinked cases in the community. That's why everybody is looking at these community cases and the unlinked numbers, and we want to see it come down. So I cannot emphasize more than, more than again and again to please stay home whenever you can, and please um, social distance, hand hygiene, universal masking. All right. I'm also asked what type of mask protects the best. There's a report of people are being arrested that they, they sold masks with high bacterial count in Hong Kong, three-ply masks versus surgical masks. <laughs> okay, so the normal, the, uh, you have the reusable mask, which is issued by the, our government, and that is the cloth mask, which you can wash and use again. It's not the best, but it is better than not having any mask at all. Now, then you have the three ply surgical masks, which right now I understand retails for something like $50 a box. So that's quite a lot of money. Uh, these three ply surgical masks, they have three layers. They have an outer hard layer. They have the middle layer, which is very important, which is the filter. And they have an inner comfort layer. Now, you may have seen uh, things on, the, on, on YouTube or videos where you open up the inside of the mask and you burn the uh, the filter layer and it, it just melts and it doesn't catch fire and that, that tells you it's a good mask all right but you have to destroy one mask to do that um, so uh, it, it, it's quite difficult to uh, kind of for the layman to tell uh, what is a good mask or what is a bad mask uh, suffice to say that um, for us, in the, as doctors, we want medical-grade three-ply surgical masks, uh, whereas for the layman, an, a mask that is um, a household mask standard, some of these surgical masks or some of these masks come as household standards, meaning that they are used for haze. For example, you have a very bad haze, you wear a surgical mask, it will filter out most of the haze particles. It's not an N95, by the way but it, it does help. So the masks coming out from China, I understand uh, most of them are household masks, meaning they are good for haze. There's another group that, there's another group of masks that is really medical grade, and these are for doctors to use, all right? Uh, they are very high medical grade, they are more costly. Uh, so, and um, this is the current situation as it is. I believe the mask, the, the the fake masks in Hong Kong with a high bacteria count are actually are just fake masks. They're, they're not even, they don't have the inner layer which doesn't burn. So it's kind of, uh, uh, that's why I understand from reading the South China Morning Post. Okay, I have another question now. And Dr. Chong, how do we disinfect the groceries that we buy from the supermarket? Or how about parcels that come from online deliveries? Honestly, not to worry. Like I said, Hand hygiene is the most important, all right? 
Do not touch your face and your hair until you've washed your hands. All right? So do not be paranoid. Even when you come out from back from outside, you press lift buttons and you've touched all kinds of services, just wash your hands. All right? And like I said, just soap and water is good enough. You don't need to destroy your hands with 70% alcohol. All right? Okay. And uh, you, that's why you see, you hear a lot of uh, news coming through the internet and from your, uh, you know, from your mobile phones, your WhatsApp and your Telegram about how uh, this virus is living for hours on, on services. I'll ignore all that. Just remember that the only thing you can do, you, you cannot, you cannot, um, you cannot make yourself paranoid. So the only thing you can do that you can control the situation is to wash your hands, all right, before you touch your face and your hair. And to me, that's good enough. Mobile phones. So another person has asked me about mobile phones, and then the, yeah, there have been many, many surveys that found that mobile phones are filthy. <laughs> so just wipe down your mobile phones, I think, once in a while, all right? Um, and um, I, again, I cannot emphasize, if you are really, really paranoid every time you touch your phone, and just don't touch your face before you wash your hands or clean your hands, all right? Okay, Dr. Chong, we've heard cases from overseas of some recovered patients who recontract the virus again. Why does this happen and will it be safe to interact with a recovered patient? What we believe is that once you have the COVID virus, you are probably immune for life. So I think this is again some fake news. Um, our SARS patients who got SARS in 2003, still have the SARS antibody today, 17 years later. So we believe, and it's actually a very similar virus. So there are actually in total six, seven coronavirus. There are four floating around in our, all around us, and these cause the common cold, and they've been around a long time. Then there was SARS in 2003, and it disappeared. There's MERS, which is the one from Saudi Arabia related to the camels, and then there's COVID. So you have seven coronaviruses all in all. And I think, again, what we believe at the moment is that if a patient has, con has contracted COVID and recovered, they should be immune for life. So I, I, I would not worry too much. Now, I've also been asked about what kinds of supplements or vitamins uh, that we can use to boost our immunity. So that's something very interesting. So first of all, a lot of my patients ask me what sort of vitamins have data. Uh, so I tell them vitamin C, vitamin D, vitamin E, omega-3 fish oil, ginkgo, evening primrose oil. This has some data backing these vitamins and how good they are. So for immunity, um, there are some people who believe that vitamin E is pretty good. You get it from nuts, spinach, seeds. Vitamin B6 is one of the B vitamins, all right? That comes from tuna, salmon, or your cold fish, and chicken and green vegetables. Then vitamin C, of course, you know, comes from orange, grapefruit, tangerine, strawberries, peppers, spinach, uh, kale, kailan, broccoli, uh, some of my patients, so these are the things that some people uh, believe that uh, these vitamins may help. So I'll just re-emphasize again, E, B, 6, and C. Some of my patients ask me about TCM, traditional Chinese medicine, and uh, I am not an expert on TCM, but some of my patients have chosen to go with TCM to boost their immunity. Uh, now, I'm being asked about rapid tests. Okay, now... All along, what we're doing right now in Singapore, which is the gold standard, 99.9999% accurate, is amplification of the DNA. We call it RT-PCR. Long word, reverse transcriptase, polymerase, polymerase chain reaction. So RT-PCR is the gold standard. This is where we amplify the DNA. And everything else is antibody tests. So antibody, there are two antibodies basically. So once you contract the COVID virus, we think about five to 10 days later, one of the antibody appears. It's called IgM, capital I, small g, big M. Then maybe 
it disappears after a while and we don't know exactly when it disappears and then somewhere between IgM appearing and disappearing IgG appears IgG appears somewhere after IgM appears and capital I small g capital G IgG goes up and stays forever yeah that's what we believe or at least for years now the antibody kits test for these two things so IgM appears first IgG appears later now the problem is we are not sure when these antibodies appear we think they appear five to ten days later the IgM so imagine if you test if you use this antibody kits in the first few days you miss the diagnosis right and that is unacceptable because if you miss the diagnosis you get clusters you get community spread right which is what we're all worried about so these rapid tests are not really useful at this point in time all right a lot of them claim very high accuracy rates of detection like 90 percent 99 percent the honest truth is uh the other day our director of medical services said that they did some tests on these test kits and they found that the performance was very disappointing in the range of 30 40 percent so very very disappointing so i think we don't have any good rapid test kits at the moment there is one being developed by Duke NUS. It's very high accuracy. And I think uh, our leadership here is trying to figure out how we're going to commercialize it. So there is some uh, pending news. Akan datang. Okay. Now, can COVID spread through the eyes? I'm being asked, already told you that uh, it's mucous membrane. So the eyes, the nose, and the mouth. Yes, it's a good idea to wear protective goggles, but only if you're a healthcare worker. <laughs> So, for example, if I'm doing a swap for my patient, I will wear a swap into the nose, or I'm looking into the mouth of a patient, I will wear goggles. There's honestly no need for you to wear goggles when you're running around outside. Healthcare workers, yes, we should wear goggles, especially if we're in an, a high-risk situation, uh, we're dealing with a COVID patient, or we're doing something, some invasive procedure on the patient. We need to wear goggles. Some people say turmeric is good. Uh, I'm sorry, I, there's no, all I can tell you is that there's no data on turmeric. <laughs> so I, I, I can't really help you there. Now, how to tell if I've caught the flu or the COVID-19? Oh, that is a very difficult question. But the flu is quite, uh, quite uh, characteristic. It's usually a sudden, a sudden uh, onset of chill or fever. So suddenly you get a chill or a fever, and you can tell me which day or what time you got it. I got it yesterday at 4 p.m. You can actually tell me. It's so sudden. Followed by muscle ache, fatigue, cough. Now, this is also similar to COVID, right? Uh, by the way, if you have the four, sudden chill, fever, or feverish feeling. Feverish feeling means I, you feel feverish, but I measure there's no fever. It's just a chill. And uh, muscle ache, fatigue, cough. I'm about 75% sure you have the influenza. And usually cough comes last. Now, the problem is that this is very difficult to distinguish from the COVID-19. So short of doing a swab, very difficult, right? So sometimes what I do for my patients is I do some blood tests. I do a blood count. I do what I call proxy testing. I do a blood count. I do an inflammation marker called C-reactive protein. I do something called sedimentation rate. And if they have a cough, sometimes I do a chest x-ray. And from this, there are certain data coming out of Wuhan, New York, and all that. We know what to look out for to kind of like tell us that, hey, the risk of COVID in this patient is very high. Better send him for a swap. All right. So this is what I do in my practice. I hope I've answered your question. Now, can virus be spread through food cooked or handled by people with virus? Uh, no, I don't think so. Because like I said, <laughs> the virus is protected by the mucus envelope on a surface. So the food is cooked and hot and steaming. So I think it's very unlikely that the, the mucus or the virus will survive. Is a four-ply surgical mask better than a three-ply surgical mask? Honestly, I've never heard of a four-ply surgical mask. I think if you, are go if you want to go above a three-ply, it's N95. But an N95, which we wear every day, is quite tiring because it increases the work of breathing. You actually 
when you talk in an N95 for the whole day, you actually feel exhausted at the end of the day. So I normally would not advise the public to wear N95 masks. And honestly, a good three-ply surgical mask, well-fitted, is found to be pretty good at preventive COVID spread. All right, we have some studies that show, it, show this. But we're still asking healthcare workers to be kiasu and wear N95. All right. I heard from some patients who are recovering, but situation turned for the worst due to, yes, immune system. Okay. okay, so this is about cytokine storm, which I didn't cover. But essentially, is us healthcare workers, everyday patients cough at in our face, our immune system is challenged every day. So our immune system is very strong. That's why we hardly get sick. Now, when we meet a new virus like COVID-19, where our immune system has never seen before, and we have a high viral load, for example, if we were in the epicenter of Wuhan or in the epicenter of New York, all the patients around us have COVID. Then we have a high viral load, and we have a huge immune response, then we're in trouble. Because it's actually this huge battle, a war that breaks out, and this usually kills a healthcare worker. So let me tell you, healthcare workers are more frightened than you are because we have a very powerful immune system. Now, it's better if it's like this, like this, like this, or like this. It's not good when it's like this. So that is why some patients have done so badly and others just have a very mild disease. I hope you understand this. So healthcare workers, if you do see a healthcare worker, please appreciate his or her situation. She or he is actually quite frightened, probably more frightened than you are. All right. There's a Belgian study that about the slipstream of a running person may carry his respiratory droplets and micro droplets further. I know this is a closed in indoor study. My hunch that it's safe to run in the outdoors. I've been running. Is it safe after all? I do running too. And I do running. I just try to avoid running with a lot of people around me. I try to move out of the way of uh, two, three people coming on my path. I just try to stay away from them. I think some social di distancing is being probably being careful. But I think it's just a good idea. Anyway, the droplets are all flying onto the floor and onto the grass and onto the pavement. So I think it's not dropping onto a surface which the other people are touching. All right. So honestly, and to try to run with a mask is impossible. Let me tell you, I've tried it. Okay. It's impossible. Uh, and there have been reports where people wore a mask and, and ran and then uh, actually got heart attacks because it overtakes their, their heart and lungs. All right. So I think it is safe to run outdoors. But please, for the sake of others and for yourself, just keep some social distance when you run. And don't run in a crowded place. Should we clean our shoes with bleach and that all after we're running? Well, I think that's really not necessary. Just leave your shoes and, uh, you know, in, a, in a place where you're not going to touch it too often. And like I said, anytime you touch your shoes or, or your floor or whatever, or any surface, wash your hands before you touch your hair and your face. Is it true that COVID-19 has long-lasting effects on the heart and lungs? What are the after effects? Well, you know, those patients, unfortunately, who have been in ICU for a long time, they probably have some damage to the lungs, some scarring, fibrosis to the lungs. So these people were likely to have some, uh, you know, lasting uh, effects on their lungs after they've been through COVID. But the majority should not have a problem. Should I stock up on Panadol? Is it true that Panadol is an effective cure? Well, <laughs> you know, our very mild COVID patients are lying in the isolation uh, wards and we're doing actually nothing. We're not treating them with anything. I'll talk about treatment shortly. And we just give them Panadol if they have a fever. That's all we do. And we swap them every 24 hours. And once they clear two swaps in 24 hours with no virus, we discharge them. All right. Honestly, that's what we're doing for a lot of these very, very mild cases. And most of them are very, very mild. Thank goodness. Now, treatment. You hear a lot of things about treatment. Hydroxychloroquine as spoken by some president. 
And uh, the honest truth is in Singapore, for our sick patients, we do not use hydroxychloroquine and uh, azithromycin. Uh, what we're using is an HIV drug called uh, Caletra, plus minus another drug called interferon. Uh, all the other things you heard about, hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, uh, redem desivir, fremisiprevir, etc., etc., are all in the context of a clinical trial. So we have some tie-ups with the American uh, Institutes of Health, and we're doing global clinical trials with them. Uh, so we are, if we are treating patients with these other things, we are using it as a clinical trial. Uh, so honestly, um, treatment-wise, it's quite hard to find an off-the-shelf drug to treat a virus um, you know, without building something from scratch. You know, my own feel is probably we have to build a new treatment from scratch. Uh, to find a drug that is ready, already off the shelf, we repurpose it to treat this virus, it's probably very unlikely. Um, one of the interesting things we are doing is we are looking at using convalescent serum. What does that mean? That means patients who have actually um, recovered from COVID, we are actually uh, using, we take a pint of the blood, separate out the red blood cells, we use a serum, we divide it into two lots, 200 mils each, about 400 mils altogether, and we can give it to two patients, for example. So we're looking at using this convalescent serum because it's chock a block full of antibodies. The best time to harvest this is within about two weeks after they have recovered. So, and got to make sure they have actually recovered. All right, otherwise you transmit the virus in the serum. So this is what we're doing. So that's just to update you on the treatment of COVID. Do cloth masks help? Well, the way I see it is um, uh, social distancing is very, very important because I already told you how infect infective this virus is. So social distancing is very important. Hand hygiene is very, very important. I think masking helps to some extent, but keep your social distance, all right? Um, like I said, cloth mask, better than no mask, all right? And anyway, it is breaking the rules if you don't wear a mask, so please wear your mask, all right? Now, my elderly parents still insist on going out, I've been asked. They wear masks but feel they have to go out every day. They're also stubborn about allowing their children to buy groceries for them. It's hard to stop them, but what can be done to try to keep them safe in this situation? Any advice for boosting immune, immune system for the elderly? So I have elderly parents too, and I keep telling them that, look, you know, <laughs> you have to play your part, right? You have to stay at home, all right? You try your best not to go out. If you do go out, go to an empty garden or a park, all right? Please wear your mask. I know they are very stubborn, and um, when we reach a certain age, we may be stubborn too, so it is not easy to deal with such a situation. So I tell my parents, look, um, if God forbid they get COVID, there are risks of being in ICU and occupying the ICU bed for a long period of time and perishing is very, very high. So this is what I've actually told my, my, my parents, you know, and uh, I leave it to you whether you want to tell them what we call a hard truth. Uh, boosting immune system for the elderly, their immune systems are generally weaker because a lot of them have chronic diseases, diabetes, hypertension, and so on, heart disease, lung disease. So it is not easy to boost the immune system. I spoke earlier on about vitamin B6, uh, vitamin E, and uh, vitamin C. So you can do something from th for them there. How long do you think think it'll take up it'll take for the situation in Singapore to clear up? Well, um, when will the vaccine be ready? The situation to clear up when the number of community cases trickles to single digits and zero. That's when probably <laughs> it'll it'll be the end of our circuit breaker. And uh, well, who knows if we reached zero early, we may even lift the circuit breaker, right? That's something we can be optimistic about. Vaccines, honestly, will take you at least 12 to 18 months. Why? Because you have three phases in a vaccine. 
So the first phase, you test it on 10 to 20 to 30 people for really for safety and whether it's useful. Then you enlarge it next to maybe 500 people to 1,000 people. All right? And again, you're looking for safety and will it work. Then the third phase is really real-world testing. So you actually roll it out to, to, to a, like a community. And that is like really real real world deployment. And that's called phase three. And honestly, anything can go wrong. So the moment it goes wrong, everything goes back to ground zero again. So I would say that everyone is optimistic and already it's so fast. There are about 70 vaccine trials ongoing and sorry, 70 vaccines uh, that have been started um, to develop. And I think about three or four of them are going into the first trials already. So let's hope and pray that we can get it within 12 to 18 months. I also heard that different strains of COVID-19 in various continents is a, is a virus mutated. So you've heard about A, B, and C uh, strains. I think, honestly, uh, let's not worry too much about these three strains. I think uh, as far as we're concerned, uh, it's, it's still doing a lot of damage. So, um, so I wouldn't really like to comment on, on A, B, and C. And some people have said that this A, B, and C has become a bit of a political issue. So we'll just leave it there. How would you advise people with family members who are unwell at this juncture and do not want to see a doctor? Well, stay at home. Stay at home, all right? Stay at home, quarantine yourself, all right? And, and uh, make sure you go see a doctor when there's fever and cough. Because 90 over percent of the COVID patients have fever and 80 over percent of the patients have cough. And one interesting, very interesting thing is that we found that about half of the patients have loss of smell. So loss of smell has become very important, all right? If there's loss of, loss of smell, go straight to see a doctor, all right? I hope that's helped. Uh, I think uh, my last question is elderly parents still insist on going out for jogging exercise. I think it's all right to go out for exercise and a walk in the park. It'll keep us sane and bring us closer to nature, and it's good for our mental state and it's good for, for keeping us physically healthy. So I would still encourage them to exercise, to go for brisk walking, jogging, or exercise. But like I said, please be careful when you do it. Please make sure you go at a different time. Don't go in a crowded area. And you know, make sure that it's, um, it's done judiciously. OK, I've come to the end of my talk now. And um, if you've enjoyed this session, give us a thumbs up. Leave us a comment to let us know whether we can talk about other th topics that you'd like to know about. And uh, please follow Families for Life Facebook for more ask, uh, hashtag ask Family for Life or FFL sessions. And share the care with your friends and other loved ones too. And everyone, please stay home, stay safe, and stay healthy. Good night.